All right, we're live. Awesome, thanks, Shubha. So, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining today's seminar. Um, before we start, I'll just like to inform that we are being recorded and live streamed on YouTube till 1 p.m. ET. So, if you do not want to be recorded, I suggest you exit Zoom and watch this talk on YouTube. Feel free to join join us back on Zoom after 1 p.m. for a participant driven discussion, which will not be recorded. Um, before going to the talk, I would like to just give a quick note about Trustworthy ML Initiative. We are a group of people interested, interested in the broad area of research encompassing trustworthy machine learning. Uh, we aim to provide easy access to fundamental resources and provide a platform for early career researchers like what we have today, uh, the Rising Star Spotlight Talks. Uh, also, in the future, we are hoping to organize symposiums and workshops to strengthen the community of uh, trustworthy ML. So uh, going to today's agenda, from uh, 12 to 12.30 p.m. ET, uh, Victor Farias will be giving his talk, and then we'll stop for a, a few minutes of Q&A. From 12.30 to 1 p.m. ET, uh, Shivani Santokar will be giving her talk, and then we'll uh, pause for a few minutes for the question and answer round. And then we'll take a five minutes break, and then we'll reconvene for a participant discussion till 1.30 p.m. ET. So uh, before further ado, I would now like to introduce uh, Victor. Uh, Victor Farias will be giving today's talk on differential privacy for non-numeric queries via local sensitivity. He is a fifth year PhD student at the Universitat Federal do Chiara, Brazil. Uh, his research interests include differential privacy, machine learning, and databases. And his thesis is on applying local sensitivity on differentially private selection with applications on graph analysis and tree induction algorithms. At this point, I would also like to welcome uh, Kevam Machado and Felipe Timbo, who are collaborators with Victor. And with that, uh, I would now like Victor to take it away. Victor, you're muted. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm trying to share my screen right now. Can you see my screen? You're good. OK, so. Um, Okay, so thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm really glad to talk um, on trustworthy ML um, about our work. So this is my thesis work. And uh, this, thesis, this work was done uh, in cooperation with uh, Felipe, Chiaro, Javam, Shubo, and Divesh. So um, this, is what, this was a joint work with uh, ATAT led research. And uh, I'm going to talk about differential privacy for non-numeric queries via local sensitivity. So first of all, a little overview about um, differential privacy. So this is uh, the pipeline that uh, you, we usually use for um, data analysis. So the first step is to collect data, right? So from devices, users, and so on, and we compose a database from those data, from those uh, informations. And then um, we need to analyze this data by um, looking at this database and um, releasing some kind of aggregate information, statistical analysis, you know, any kind of, um, of analysis. Then um, with this information has been uh, shown that uh, for um, naive anonymizations and uh, more, um, older forms of privacy that if you have an attacker that has some kind of um, side information, it can uh, re-identify, um, for example, my friend Smith that was in initially uh, in our um, data collection step, right? So in the scenario, um, differential privacy um, um, becomes a layer here between uh, the database and the analysis. So uh, a differentially private mechanism will take the database as input and uh, um, private release some kind of analysis that somehow, in, in, uh, and we expect that the attacker cannot um, re-identify our Smith. So our Smith here should be uh, anonymous in, um, in this analysis, right? 
So the main idea in um, differential privacy is that the presence of a user should be near indistinguishable. What I mean with that. So um, formally, um, to answer to a query from uh, on the database, um, we need to provide the randomized algorithm, right, M. And uh, it, it's, um, it's worth noting that uh, the um, definition differ, the differential privacy is not an algorithm, it's a definition. So it's a constraint that it's imposed to randomize algorithm in order to be uh, anonymized, right, in private. So a randomized algorithm M satisfy uh, epsilon differential privacy if for any two databases that differs in one user, right? So if this user is present or not, and for any output of this mechanism, we have that uh, the probability of the mechanism outputting O on the database X is bounded by exponential of uh, Epsilon. This term here, I will uh, talk about it uh, about it in a few, in a few seconds, right? And times probability of the mechanism outputting O for the database X prime, right? So note that this definition is symmetric. So we have an upper bound and a lower bound for the probability of um, the mechanism outputting O for a database X, right? Then this parameter here, the parameter epsilon, we call it the privacy budget. It controls the trade-off between utility and privacy. So the lower epsilon is, um, more loose this uh, constraint is. So, sorry, the, the less it's, so the more um, restrict it is, right? So we have more privacy, but we have less utility and accuracy, right? And the opposite also holds if, if you have a higher, um, a larger epsilon, um, the bounds are um, looser, then we have less privacy, but we can have better utility or uh, accuracy for our mechanisms. Right? And in this work, we work with differential privacy specifically for non numeric queries. An example, a simple example for a non numeric query is uh, what is the dominant color of? Uh, the clothes, the clothes of the users in this the database X, right? So this uh, query here, it has a discrete output. So the set of all possible outputs, the range is blue, green, red, and gray, right? And for this query, um, in the, in the pri non-numeric private setting, um, the analyst needs to provide a utility function U, right? This is very important, that provides a score of how useful an answer is. So a um, suitable um, utility function for this scenario is the number of occurrences of a given color, right? So the utility for blue is five because it has five persons, people with it. So for green is two because it has two and for red is two and for gray is one. And in this scenario, um, the most non-mechanism, private mechanism in the literature for um, providing um, differential privacy for, privacy for uh, non-numeric queries is the exponential mechanism. The exponential mechanism, it perturbs the output of uh, non-numeric functions by injecting noise to the answer, right? So the exponential mechanism, what it does is that it samples a answer R, one of the answers from the range, right? This is the range for our query. With probability proportional to epsilon times the utility of that answer divided by two times delta U, right? Delta U is the global sensitivity and I will talk about it in a few uh, moments, right? So the larger the uh, utility, uh, the more um, likely it is to be uh, sampled and uh, produced by the mechanism. So we want the best answers to have higher utility than high probability of being um, um, output, right, of, of being produced. And then I describe a little bit. I describe what is our global sensitivity here, delta u. And but before that, I need to um, show what uh, the definition of neighboring databases is. 
right? This definition it has to do with our um, notion of presence or not of users in the database. So given a database X, uh, we can obtain a neighbor database of X by excluding, removing one user like this. So this is a, all of those are neighboring databases of um, X. And also we can obtain a database X by uh, inserting a, uh, a user, right? So any, any user inserted, it's, um, it uh, produces a uh, neighboring database of X, right? So this with this definition, we can think about uh, the global sensitivity, which is the way we calibrate the noise on uh, the exponential mechanism. So here is the global sensitivity, right? Delta U. So first look at this part here of the, right, of the definition. So this part here, it uh, measures, so given two databases X and Y, it measures the maximum difference of utility for all answers in the range, right? For all R's in the range, right? And then we want to measure it for every database in, uh, in the universe of databases, right? For every pair, sorry, for every pair of databases in the universe of databases. So here we have all databases um, possible in our application, right? So I want to measure this inner part for D0 and D1, D1, D5, D1 and D6, and so on for every pair of, uh, of databases, right? So what is the effect? So it so important important uh, property of it is it, it not it does not depend on the input database, right? So um, given a database, it doesn't matter what database the input is. The global sensitivity is the same for every database in the application. And the effect of the global sensitivity in um, the mechanism, the exponential mechanism, is this. So the larger the global sensitivity is, more noise we inject and less utility accuracy we have. And that the opposite also holds, right? So we want um, mechanisms and functions that have low sensitivity, right? That have low sensitivity. So we inject less noise and we have better utility and accuracy. Right? And then, um, okay, so a brief comment about mechanisms also for numeric functions. So the most known one is uh, the Laplace mechanism, which injects noise sample from the, the Laplace distribution. And it also calibrates the noise using the notion of uh, global sensitivity. And then a most recent one, which is not that recent, is 2007. Um, the smooth sensitivity, uh, it's, it injects noise sampled from the Cauchy distribution, but it calibrates the noise using the notion of local sensitivity, right? The local sensitivity, it measures sensitivity, right? The um, change on the utility function on the input database, which is different from the global sensitivity, which measures for everybody, right? And usually the local sensitivity is less than global sensitivity, which means that it reduces noise. So our research question is, can local sensitivity reduce noise for um, injected to the non-numeric non queries, right? Because local sensitivity was not um, used for uh, non-numeric queries before, right? So can we do it? Is, is, is it feasible, right? So uh, for that, uh, we propose the local dampening mechanism, right? So the local dampening mechanism, we introduce the notion of local sensitivity now to the non-numeric setting, right? So this inner part, part here of the definition is the same as the global sensitivity, but now we don't measure this for the whole universe of databases. We measure this for only the only for D0, which is now our input database, or D0 and its neighbors, right? To its neighbors, okay? In our approach, we also need um, a more, ge more general approach that 
measures local sensitivity at distance t. What do I mean with that? So I, this inner part is also the same, right? This inner part is also the same, but now I can uh, measure uh, this sensitivity part here, the inner, for neighbors and also the neighbors of neighbors, right? So neighbors of neighbors, we say that they are databases at distance um, two, right? So I can, I can uh, measure um, the utility difference for those, right? D0 to D4 and also to D4 and D12, D11 and so on, right? And there's a third, um, even more generic um, notion of a local local uh, sensitivity, which is the element local sensitivity, right? Right, which is the same thing as the last one, but what changes is this inner part here, right? So finally, this inner part is a little different because um, before, let me go back here, we would measure like for every answer in the range, we would measure the difference of uh, utility function. But now in the element local sensitivity, we have R and answer as um, parameter. And then we measure the difference of utility only for this um, answer, right? Only for this answer. And we use all those definitions to um, in our, in our um, local dampening mechanism, right? Which I'm introducing right now. So um, given all those definitions, the local dampening mechanism also use the exponential distribution as the exponential mechanism. And uh, the local dampening mechanism samples uh, an answer R from the range with probability proportional to exponential epsilon times du. Now I, I replace um, the utility function by the dampened utility function. Right, so I attenuate the utility function so we can have a um, low sensitivity utility function and uh, we hope that we have um, uh, better accuracy. Right, so here, our dampening function, right? So um, the x-axis, we uh, provide the utility, which will map to the dampened utility. And this function is uh, built by uh, the linear uh, the linear interpolation, the piecewise linear interpolation of uh, um, the local sensitivity and uh, the uh, one, two, and three on the y-axis. So here in the y-axis, we have the local sensitivity only at distance zero, right? Then we have the local sensitivity uh, at distance zero plus local sensitivity at distance one, and then we have local sensitivity at distance zero plus distance one plus distance two, right? And the intuitive effect of this local dampening mechanism is that, right? So in the exponential mechanism, we have this probability and those are the utilities part, U over delta over global sensitivity. And what our local dampening, our dampening function does is that it spreads the value of the utility values, right? The utility scores. So when we spread the utility scores, we make that the highest score value, it has a um, higher um, probability of, of being output, which means better accuracy, right? And also the, um, the uh, element with less um, score, it has a lower probability of being an output, right? So higher the, the larger the spread, largely accuracy we have. So that's intuitively what uh, our local dependent mechanism does. And then also we have a second version of our local dampening mechanism, which is the shifted local dampening, uh, which we use for um, when we have a correlation between the utility and the local sensitivity, right? I won't go deep on this version, I just will mention that uh, it exists and that works by uh, taking advantage of that correlation, right? And that's the version that it's really, uh, have performs well for our application that I will show in this, in this talk. And uh, it works by uh, shifting the utility function so that um, 
we can have a, um, a, a better spread on uh, the damp and the utility values, right? And the utility scores, right? So I won't go deep on that, but uh, I will mention that because it will appear in our experiments and it's our um, best version for this application that I'm showing. So the application that I'm bringing today is um, influential node analysis. Um, in our work, we have other applications, but this one I think was uh, the most um, expressive result we had so far. So the task for the influential node analysis is to release the label of the top K most influential nodes, right? So in this work, we use the egocentric between centrality as influence metric. So EBC is our utility function, right? So a brief um, uh, definition of uh, EBC is that, so for each pair UV, right, in the neighborhood of V, we sum up all these terms one over um, the number of geodesic paths from U to V in the neighborhood of V, right? The neighborhood, yeah. So if U and V are not neighbors, so A to B, right? It accounts for zero points, right? Because they are neighbors. A to C, they account with zero points because they are, they are neighbors. And B to C, they account with 0 0.5 point because um, there are two paths from B to C, right? There's the path BVC and BAC. So the egocentric between centrality of V is 0 0.5. Um, and this is our approach to um, release um, top K um, nodes, the label of the top K nodes. So the core of our algorithm is this part right here, which is um, basically K calls to a non-numeric mechanism. When I say non-numeric mechanism, I mean the exponential mechanism and also the local dampening mechanism, right? So I call it um, K times, right? And uh, I, I, each time I take one node uh, from, uh, from the graph. So um, in our experiments, I replace this mechanism to the exponential mechanism. So I need also to provide the global sensitivity since I'm using the um, exponential mechanism. And this is the global sensitivity, right? So um, where delta G is the maximum degree of the graph. So we have this, we don't need to understand it right now, right? And also local sensitivity, um, we need to provide the local sensitivity to the local dampening mechanism, right? So uh, I provide here an upper bound for the local sensitivity, which is also possible in our, in our approach. And we have something that looked like the uh, that looks like the global sensitivity, right? So what we have to understand here, I think um, the most important thing is that for this problem, the local sensitivity here, right? So DGV is the degree of V in the graph G. Um, the local sensitivity is less than uh, the uh, global sensitivity. So we have we should have better accuracy. So this is our experiments. So EM stands for exponential mechanism, LG stands for local dampening, and SLG stands for shifted local dampening. Right. So here we have um, in the x axis, we have the epsilon, the privacy budget from 10 to the power of minus 3 to the 10 of power 4. And in the y axis, we have the accuracy. The accuracy is the number of uh, the proportion of um, True, node, true top K nodes that we've retrieved, right? So retrieve nodes intersection um, and they take the cardinality over K, right? So, um, and uh, we also change, I uh, also vary, um, vary K from five, 10 to um, 20, right? So here we have in blue, we have our local dampening mechanism, right? In um, red, we have our um, exponential mechanism. And then in black, we have the shifted local dampening mechanism, right? So we seek that in general, in general, our shifted local dampening mechanism in black, it uh, can reduce the use of privacy budget by two to four, right? Two to five times, uh, five order of magnitude, 
right, uh, compared to the exponential mechanism. And also we see that uh, uh, the local dampening, the first version is not suitable for this, uh, for this problem, right? Because of the correlation. And also the effect of K is that uh, the less K um, for a smaller case, we have better accuracy in general because we can use a more privacy budge, budget in each call of the exponential mechanism or the local dependent mechanism. And uh, we um, have uh, less privacy budget for each call when we have K equals 20, right? So to conclude this talk, now, so we introduced the notions of local sensitivity to the non-numeric setting. We propose a novel differentially private mechanism for the non-numeric queries using local sensitivity. Um, for the inflation node applications, we could reduce the use of budget by two to four orders of magnitude. And also in this talk, we have omitted some, uh, some things like we omitted some theoretical curious guarantees that we have in our papers and uh, add applications such uh, decision tree induction, right? So it's uh, in er early development yet, the decision tree inductions we have uh, is still uh, uh, a first, like a first approach on a uh, tree induction, uh, uh, induction algorithms, but as future direction, we want to go deep on that. So we start to go in deep on uh, applying our, our local dependent mechanism decision trees and random forests, right? And also we are work, working on the applications for the, the local dependent mechanism, which is the multi-objective multi selection, right? So thanks for the invitation. Um, um, I will be taking questions on our um, Q&A section. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for such an informative talk, Victor. So uh, I guess I have a few questions. So uh, when you were talking about local sensitivity, you mentioned about one hop neighbors rather than using just the uh, immediate uh, nodes belonging to the input database. So is it like uh, we can also go to two hop neighbors and three hop neighbors, or is it like we are restricted to just one hop neighbors in this case? Yeah. So this definition here on the right, I think it matches more what uh, you're thinking. So in this, this definition here in the right, so we can uh, measure the sensitivity, okay, for one hop only or two mm -hmm. hops, three hops. So it's controlled by this parameter T, which we call it distance T. So mm -hmm. the higher the T, um, the more hops we can uh, measure. And then if you have T large enough, we, you would just get the global sensitivity. And is there a trade-off between the ski and the accuracy of the model? Um, I don't think that's uh, a question of trade-off. It's more like we need the ski to produce, um, to build this, um, this function, right? So mm -hmm. this function, it uses, you know, um, the, the, local diff, the local sensitivity at distance zero to possibly you know, infinite, as long as it needs. So it can go on and on, this, this graph here, like this function, mm -hmm. and we can um, call uh, local sensitivity at distance, you know, more than uh, the number of uh, uh, nodes in the database, for example, the records in the database. Right, I see. And the final question would be, you mentioned the uh, geodesic path when you were calculating uh, in that slide. So, you, you were just mentioning about two, two paths from B to A and B to C. So was there a reason why we don't consider paths like B, A, B, C? Um, I think I missed something from your question. Can you repeat, please? So here you were mentioning uh, like uh, paths like B, A, C or B, V, C, but we can also go from B to C using the path B, A, V, C, right? Mm -hmm. So B, yeah. Um, so it's the geodesic path, right? So if I look at the pair B, C, mm -hmm. right, I don't consider the path B, A, V, C, because the geodesic paths from B to C are B, V, and C, and the other one is B, A, and C, right? So I don't look at this, those paths, right? The definition of uh, egocentric between centrality. 
So here, I think, so I just have two. So uh, and just to clarify, so I have two paths from B to C, right? Mm -hmm. So one over two. So I have zero point five for um, the pair B and C. Right. Okay, that makes sense. So I guess uh, yes, we don't have any more questions. So I would like to thank Victor again. Thank you very much. Right. And. Uh, now I would like to uh, introduce uh, Shivani, who is our second speaker. Uh, so Shivani will be giving her talk on how do ML models make decisions. Shivani Santulkar is a PhD student at MIT ECS department, and she is advised by Alexander Matri and Nils Shavit. Her research involves around two broad themes. Uh, the first is developing a precise understanding of widely used deep learning techniques. And the second is of identifying avenues to make machine learning be more robust and reliable. Prior to joining MIT, uh, she received her bachelor's from uh, IIT Bombay, and she's a recipient of the Google Fellowship Award too. Uh, with that, uh, I would now ask Shivani to take it away. Um, sorry, just an issue with Zoom. Um, Can you see my slides? Perfect. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for having me here today. I am really excited to talk to you guys about some of my recent work on understanding how machine learning models make decisions. And before I get started, I just wanted to say that all this work would not have been possible without my amazing collaborators. Uh, and this is work done while they were at MIT, uh, at Google and at Berkeley. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, it's it's needless for me to say that in the last decade, we've seen machine learning models do remarkable things. So it started with the success of some of these models on these classic benchmark tasks, for instance, the ImageNet image classification challenge. And now we're increasingly seeing uh, machine learning models, particularly deep networks, do really well at complex benchmarks across domains from vision to NLP to robotics. And so with all these developments and all this excitement, we find ourselves at the next step in machine learning, where uh, we're starting to take some of our models from these carefully curated benchmarks where they were developed, and we're starting to deploy them in the real world in applications like credit assessment or criminal justice, in these applications where the stakes are also very real. And so while, at, while we're at this threshold where we're starting to deploy our models in the real world, we're faced with this question. You know, are we there yet? Do we have the right kinds of tools and techniques to ensure that our models can perform reliably, robustly, safely, fairly in the real world? Is it just now a matter of scaling up and building bigger models with more data? And so this question has been underlying a lot of the work that I've done during my PhD and to give you a bit of a sneak peek into my talk, uh, the answer to this question, in my view, is actually no. And the reason for this is that even though our machine learning models do really well on various benchmarks, the reasons why they do so well on many of these tasks are fundamentally different from what we ideally envision. But before I tell you more about this, I'm going to start the story at a slightly different point in the phenomenon of adversarial examples. So say we have this image of a dog that's classified correctly by your favorite state-of-the-art classifier. To this image, we can add this carefully chosen perturbation and end up with this image on the right that looks basically indistinguishable, but that the state-of-the-art classifier now classifies very differently as a cat. And adversarial examples, when they were first discovered, were a particularly striking and puzzling discovery in machine learning, because it seemed that even though our models do really well, on these same benchmarks, you can completely nullify their performance by just adding this tiny perturbation. So naturally, this phenomenon has gathered a lot of attention over the last couple of years, and numerous hypotheses have been proposed for why adversarial examples exist. So these include things like, this could be some high dimensional phenomenon or the result of some kind of statistical fluctuations in the data, or because we train our models to do well on average, but now we're testing them in the worst case, or simply some course of using large over-parameterized models like ResNets. 
But the underlying theme behind a lot of these hypotheses is that adversarial examples are some kinds of bugs or aberrations, and that they will just go away, hopefully, as we make our models bigger and train them on more data. But is this really the case? In order to understand this, let's go back to the illustration of adversarial examples. Now, from our standpoint, what's particularly puzzling about this illustration is that we just added to the image this meaningless perturbation. The image on the left and the image on the right look identical to us. However, the machine learning model perceives them very, very differently. But note that this is only a human perspective. So what, what do I mean by this? So when we as humans are required to perform a classification task, say distinguishing between dogs and cats, we might pick up on features like the snout of the dog or the whiskers of the cat to make this distinction. But from the perspective of the machine learning model, there's no such thing as a dog or a cat. There's no such thing as an image. All the model is seeing is a bunch of pixels in a matrix, and the model has to learn to associate this with some numeric or string label. So maybe after looking at a couple of examples, the machine learning model concludes that these specific patterns are correlated with the class dog and cat, respectively. And note that all the model is trying to do is just to maximize its accuracy. So thus, in order to think about adversarial examples, maybe, maybe rather than looking at this illustration, we should try to put ourselves in the model's shoes and instead think of adversarial examples as something like this where you have some pixelated image of a dog, you add to it some pattern, and now the model sees a cat. So in this bottom illustration, if you focus on the perturbation specifically, is it immediately obvious that this perturbation is meaningless? And this is the question that we actually tried to explore in some of our recent work, where we tried to better understand what adversarial examples actually are. And in order to do so, we designed a simple experiment. But before I tell you about the experiment, let me quickly recap the standard supervised learning classification setup. So in supervised learning, usually we have a label data set. For simplicity here, I'll talk about a binary dog versus cat data set, but this could be a multi-class data set instead. And uh, then what we do is we usually pick our favorite classifier, say a ResNet 50, train it on this data set to minimize the loss, and then we would evaluate the model on some kind of holdout test set. Naturally, if you do this simple thing in practice, you'll find that state-of-the-art classifiers do really well. They get more than 90% accuracy on this dog versus cat classification task, and this should not come as any surprise to anyone because our models, after all, can do better on like way harder tasks than this. Okay, so now to understand adversarial examples, let's make a tiny change to this setup. So in particular, we'll replace the standard training set with a data set of adversarial examples. So every single data point in this training set will be constructed by finding adversarial examples to a pre-trained dog versus cat classifier. For instance, the classifier we trained on the previous slide. So basically for every dog in my training set, I'll add an adversarial perturbation to make the previous classifier think it's a cat and then add these to my training set. And then similarly for every cat in my training set, I'll add a perturbation to make the previous model think it's a dog and add these to my training set. So note that now we end up with this new training set, which is of the same size as the training set we had before. And in fact, to us looks indistinguishable from the training set we had before. The only difference is that every single data point now contains an adversarial perturbation added did. Now, before we go on to train our classifier, we'll make one final change to this training set. We'll actually swap the labels. So now we end up with this new training set, which consists of adversarial examples and actually flipped labels. And now we'll train a fresh classifier on this data set. It could be a different architecture, say BGG16, and now we'll test it on the test set. Note that nothing has changed about the test set. It's the same test set as the, we had in the previous slide. So how well will this model do? If you think about it from the perspective of humans, of you and I, you'll see that if we were to learn based on this training set, we'd actually get 0% accuracy on the test set. After all, the training set is completely mislabeled with respect to the test set. So everything that looks like a dog to me, I would learn to call it a cat on the test set, which would be incorrect. And similarly, everything that looks like a cat to me, I would learn to call it a dog on the test set, which would also be incorrect. However, if you actually do this experiment in practice, 
you'll see that the picture is actually very, very different. The state of the art models still do well, even if you train them on these mislabeled data sets, like they can get close to 80% accuracy. So how is this possible? What's going on? In order to understand this, let's take a step back and let's look at a more conceptual view of our data. So usually when we think of our data, we think of it as having two kinds of features. Useful features that actually help us perform the classification task, as in they tell us something about the label and help us get good accuracy, and useless features, which are just random noise that are just present in our data sets. So the traditional view of adversarial examples is centered around these useless features. Basically, adversarial examples stem from these bugs where our models, because of overfitting or SGD noise or something else, end up assigning weight to these useless features. And although these features don't help the model with classification, they cause the model to be very sensitive to the adversarial perturbation. So from this viewpoint, if we go back and look at our previous experiment, we have our data set, which has a bunch of useful features, which is correlated with the label. And to this, we added an adversarial perturbation, which just manipulated the useless features in the image. And so then we end up with this adversarial example training set where the useful features remain unchanged, but now we flip the label. So now if you look at this adversarial example training set, if you were to learn the correlation between the useful features and the label, you would once again get 0% accuracy on the test set, just as we humans do. Because on the test set, dog useful features are in dog labeled images. So this illustration then is not enough to explain how in our experiment we're actually able to generalize with the test set. So thus we realize that maybe we need to change our mental model of the data a bit. And maybe rather than thinking of adversarial examples as these bugs, maybe we need to think about them differently. Maybe these adversarial examples are actually changing some of the predictive features in the data. So to understand this, let's go back to the mental model of the data. And now, rather than thinking of useful features as one big chunk, we'll further break them down into robust and non-robust features. Now, both robust and non-robust features are correlated with the label in the sense that they help you get good accuracy on the test set. Robust features are those that remain correlated with the label even when the adversary adds a small perturbation to the image. So these could be things like the snout of the dog or the grass in the background. These might be features that are correlated with the class dog. And even if you add a tiny perturbation to the image, it doesn't change the correlation of these features with the label. In contrast, non-robust features are features that are also predictive of the label, but can be easily flipped by the adversary. So you can intuitively think of these features as like small differences in texture between dog and cat or small differences in lighting. So these might actually also be predictive of the label. However, the adversary can easily manipulate them with a small perturbation. Note that from the perspective of a model just trying to maximize its accuracy, any feature that's useful, any feature that tells it something about the label is a great feature to use. And as a result, our models often rely on non-robust features as well. And even though this gets them accuracy, this also costs them robustness. So going back to our previous experiment, now in our training set, rather than thinking of just one kind of useful features, we've further broken it down into robust and non-robust features. And now when we add the adversarial perturbation, rather than thinking about it as manipulating the useless features, we instead think about it as actually adding non-robust features of class cat. Now, if you look at the resulting uh, example in the adversarial example training set, you'll see that robust features in, of this example are uh, unchanged because that's just by definition. However, the non-robust features now point towards the opposite class, which is actually also the label. So once again, if you were to learn the association between robust features and the label, this would be misleading and you would get 0% accuracy on the test set. However, it turns out that the non-robust features are actually correctly correlated with the uh, incorrect label. And in fact, as we see from our experiment, are enough for you to actually generalize on the test set. So what does this tell us? Now, on one hand, this gives us a new perspective on adversarial examples. It tells us that adversarial examples are not just some kinds of bugs, but are intrinsically tied to how our models are making their decisions. And so more broadly, this also gives us a new perspective on how models actually learn. So when we as humans think about machine learning models learning, we often think about these human meaningful features and expect models to rely on these features to perform their decisions. However, what the experiment before shows is that our data set contains a bunch of other features as well, features that are imperceptible or unintuitive to us. 
And from the perspective of a model, just trying to maximize accuracy, a priority, there's no reason why it would choose one over the other. And in fact, this finding has actually uh, been consistently observed over the last couple of years. In fact, there's been a lot of evidence that models rely on other unintuitive features, for example, high frequency information or backgrounds or texture. So overall, models relying on these undesirable features can have clear consequences on robustness, as we saw here. But in some of our work, we also discuss how this can have consequences on interpretability. Because after all, if our models are relying on these imperceptible or unintuitive features, can we even argue that they're human interpretable? And going beyond this, if we actually care about deploying our models in the real world, you can imagine that models reliance on such undesirable features can ha also have implications for things like fairness and ethics, because you can't really argue that your model is doing the right thing if it's relying on features that don't even make sense to you. So how do we go about fixing this? The first step to actually fix this uh, most naturally is to actually somehow control the features that our models rely on so that they don't rely on such undesirable features. And in the light of the discussion so far, you might say, okay, so what if we just prevent our models from relying on non-robust features? And while this might seem kind of abstract and you know, we might worry we don't know how to actually do this, it turns out that in the robustness community, there's been a lot of work to build uh, defenses against adversarial examples. And if you view these methods from a different perspective, they're indirectly preventing models from relying on non-robust features. So for instance, instead of training our models with standard ERM training, we could instead do something like robust training, where the goal is not only to have low loss on all training points, but also that the model should be insensitive to small perturbations of these training points. So you could imagine these perturbations as being things like rotations or translations or small L2 perturbations. And intuitively, robust training can be thought of as another way to impose some kind of prior on the model to kind of control what kinds of features it can rely on in the first place. So are robust models better? So there's actually been a long line of work trying to study robust models, and they found many interesting things. For instance, that robust models actually tend to have more human aligned or seemingly more human aligned uh, featured representations. And these representations have interesting downstream consequences. For instance, they tend to be better at various downstream vision tasks and also for things like transfer learning. And more broadly, there's also some increasing evidence that robust models could be a useful primitive to build models that are interpretable by design, where we don't need to use any post hoc interpretability techniques, but simple gradient based visualizations actually shed light into what features the models are using. Okay, so clearly robust models seem promising, but ultimately they're just fixing one part of the problem. And so in order to actually fix this problem, uh, I think we actually need to take a step back and think about what kinds, how our models should actually be learning in the first place. In particular, we need to go back to the drawing board and look at our entire machine learning pipeline, right from the data sets that we use to the objectives that we train our models with, to how we test them and how we interpret them, all from the perspective of understanding what kinds of features our models are using and whether these features will actually generalize to the real world tasks that we care about. And I don't have time to go into all the components uh, listed on the slide here, but I wanted to give you a bit of a flavor of this work and talk specifically about some of the recent work we've done on better understanding data set design. So there's been a lot of work recently on trying to study data sets in machine learning. And the resounding conclusion from a lot of these works is that data sets often contain all these unintended biases. And these could be things like photographer bias or spurious correlations in our medical data sets or other biases, for instance, racial biases or gender biases that our data sets, even common data sets like ImageNet are propagating. So naturally you can imagine that if our real world is biased, and we collect data without being mindful of these biases, some of these biases would end up propagating into our data sets and then into our models. But in some of our recent work, we actually looked at the data collection process and how it affects these biases. And what we found is that common data collection pipelines not only do nothing to fix these biases, but often actually exacerbate them. And in order to understand this, let's look at data set creation. So ideally, you'd imagine that we collect our data sets like this. We gather a bunch of real world data, have expert annotators label them, and end up with this perfect data set. However, naturally, this doesn't scale to like large data sets with millions of images. 
So in practice, the picture looks very different. For instance, for ImageNet, the data set was collected as follows. The creators first identified a set of interesting categories. And then for each of these categories, they sourced images automatically by scraping search engines like Google and Flickr. And finally, they validated these images with the help of crowd workers on mTurk. So specifically, they showed images that were retrieved for a particular class, for instance, golden retriever, to, uh, to annotators on mTurk in a grid and asked them to pick all the images that actually had golden retrievers in them. So this appears to be a fairly natural process to collect data at scale. However, when you look at it more closely, you'll realize that the annotation task has a bias. Actually, the contains task is phased as the leading question. Annotators are only asked whether one particular label is valid for the image, and they're not even made aware of any of the other classes in the data set. So in this work, we actually tried to understand the implications of this bias in the annotation task on the ImageNet data set and on models trained on ImageNet as well. And what we found is that for many of the images in ImageNet, the single label does not really capture the ground truth. And these are not just random errors the way we might you know, expect, but they're actually systematic deviations between the label and the ground truth. For instance, there are many ImageNet classes which have overlapping distributions on which our models are getting no better than 50% accuracy since AlexNet. And in retrospect, you can understand why this happened because they correspond to a bunch of fine grained class differences and annotators weren't really able to tell these apart in the contains task. In addition to these overlapping classes, we also see issues like multi-object images where there's a large fraction of ImageNet for which multiple ImageNet labels apply. And even for uh, several of these images, the ImageNet label is not even the main object label in the image. So for instance, the ImageNet label, which corresponds to the Flickr search query is not the same as what annotators in our experiments think is the main label for this image. All this to say that in our data sets, there are a large number of biases and ambiguities with the labels. However, when we actually train our models, we treat our data sets as the ground truth, as the gold standard. And as a result in doing so, we are somehow forcing our models to pick up on features that are not necessarily the ones that we actually want them to use. Okay, so to conclude, uh, one of the key findings in this body of work is that there's this large misalignment between humans and machine learning models today, that even though our models do really well on benchmarks, the reasons for some of these successes are actually very different from what we expect. And from this standpoint, adversarial examples are just a natural manifestation. And more broadly, if we actually care about building robust and reliable and explainable models, we actually need to rethink how our models should be learning in the first place. And this includes training and evaluation beyond just single label accuracy. This includes collecting data sets and debiasing them with the downstream task in mind. And finally, paying more attention to the features that our models are actually using and actually designing tools to debug and engineer these. And if you're interested in reading more about this work, you can check out some of the blog posts that we maintain at the lab. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks for the awesome talk, Shivani. So uh, I guess we have, we have a question from Kai Stevenson. So I will, can you please uh, turn Kai into a panelist and let him ask his question? Kai, can you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, hello. Uh, thanks for the great talk. My question was, like most examples in your work focus on images. I was wondering mm -hmm. what extent your insights and techniques generalize other domains like NLP or et cetera. Yeah, so I guess like um, the, a lot of the stuff that we've done in the context of adversarial examples has been largely uh, tied to images because, you know, adversarial examples are in general a phenomenon that's very much easier to study in the image domain than in the NLP domain because of discreteness, even though there's been a lot of work that's been done on the NLP domain as well. But more broadly, I feel like these findings about our models relying on 
unintuitive features, I think it holds across domains. And there's like a lot of evidence for this that's building where, you know, we find that our models are basically just taking a bunch of shortcuts to uh, perform the tasks that they are trained to. And uh, so I believe that this like broader finding about our models relying on unintuitive or undesirable features holds more broadly than just uh, images. Uh, in the context of uh, NLP models, for example, it's much harder to define what like an, uh, imp the equivalent of an imperceptible feature is. So it's hard to uh, talk more concretely about uh, these things in the NLP domain. We have our next question from Shaiti. Jadi, can you please unmute yourself? Sure. Thanks. Hi, Shivani. Thanks for the very interesting yeah. talk. So uh, I wanted to know that if we are able to find any alternative approach to get uh, robust features from the data set, like uh, without using an already adversely robust classifier. So could it turn out to be like a much cheaper way to make our uh, classifiers adversely robust given that adversarial training is like very uh, expensive? Yeah, definitely. So one of the things that uh, I think Jaideep is talking about that we didn't, uh, I didn't really go through in this talk is that we also had in our work an approach to actually remove the non-robust features from the training set. And so you end up with this data set that when you train standard models on, they end up to be more robust than standard models trained via ERM because the data set no longer has non-robust features. However, our approach is not like a new way to get robust models because it implicitly relies on robust models to do this procedure. But to answer your question, Jadeep, I definitely think that there would be a great way forward to actually you know, get robust models without paying the cost of adversarial training because at least you know, typical adversarial training approaches are still slower than standard training. So I think that would be great if there was a way to identify robust features without using robust models. Awesome, thanks Shivani. Awesome. That was all the Q and A. Uh, I thank okay. again Victor Thanks and Shivani for, for the talks. Yes, and uh, I'd like just to announce the next week. Okay. Yeah. So we'll be taking a break for five minutes and then we'll reconvene for the participant discussion. Uh, both Victor and Shivani, feel free to uh, stay or leave uh, as you may. And uh, just a note for a few uh, upcoming seminar on March 18th, we'll be having Catherine Heller from Google and Duke University, and she'll be giving a talk in our Trustworthy ML Seminar Series.